A warm welcome to all of you. Such a great group of alumni and alumni joining us from all around the world. Uh, this is probably not the reunion any of us expected uh, as uh, recently as three or four months ago. But here we are, having gone down the rabbit hole together with Alice uh, and finding ourselves in a very different universe. And so we'll make the, the best of this online reunion. And I want to introduce you to this session that has been put together by the Andlinger Center for Energy and the Environment. I am Elke Weber, your moderator. Uh, and I'm the Gerhard Andlinger Professor in Energy and the Environment, uh, as well as Associate Director for Education at the Andlinger Center, and also Professor for Psychology and Public Affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School. Uh, the session is entitled Parallels Between COVID-19 and Climate Change. Uh, ending our center insights on science, policy, and public opinion. Joining me on this virtual stage uh, are three dear colleagues, uh, each of whom will give some brief introductory remarks uh, and then join me in some discussion. After that, we'll open the floor to questions from you, the audience. So as you listen to these initial remarks in our discussion, why don't you start posing questions to us uh, using the Q&A feature on the bottom of your Zoom window. So use Q&A, not chat, uh, to post questions. Uh, and then I will afterwards select from this list of posters questions when we open the floor for, for your questions. Uh, I think it would be nice if we could hear you post that question in your own voice. So when I mention your name uh, or the Zoom identifier that I have for you, we'll, we will enable your audio. Uh, could you then please state your name, uh, class here and major, and then ask your question uh, and tell us to whom the question is addressed. Okay, so let me introduce my panel uh, in the order in which they present the introductory remarks. Rob Sokolow is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering here at Princeton. Uh, Bob Cohane is Professor Emeritus of International Affairs and Political Science in the Woodrow Wilson School here. And last but certainly not least, Jesse Jenkins is Assistant Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and in the Endlinger Center for Energy and the Environment. So let's turn to the two crises that we will try to connect in our session today. Uh, the climate crisis has been around for a while. As you know, it has been identified uh, more than three decades ago. ago. Uh, and the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is very recent. For some of us, it might seem like a black swan, uh, this un unpredictable outlier tail event that Nassim Taleb uh, sort of coined in 2007. Others argue it's more like a gray rhino. Uh, that's uh, uh, the title of a book that Michelle Walker uh, wrote in 2016, arguing that there are many events that are in fact quite probable but are neglected threats. Uh, and so we can talk a little bit about what, which one it is. Um, and we'll talk also about similarities uh, and differences uh, between those two prices, you know, both in, the, in their perception by the general public and in people's willingness to respond to them. Uh, and that they have to do with uh, differences in psych psychological distance, for example. Uh, climate change is something that to most of us seems more distant than the COVID pandemic and in other dimensions. Uh, Rob Sokolow will start by providing some broader observations. Then Bob Cohen will add to those and also describe some preliminary results from a larger national panel survey that he and I and two postdocs have in the field right now that assesses and connects public attitudes and responses to the two crises. And then Jesse Jenkins uh, will follow up by talking about some ways to go forward to address both of these crises. So uh, can I call on you, Rob, uh, to start us off? Sure. Uh, thank you all for putting the time aside for attending. I've spoken in the flesh to some of you in former alumni uh, panels. This will have to do. Week after week, the agony of COVID-19 keeps revealing important truths to everyone who's listening to our panel today. In my case, two currents of thought keep surfacing that are related to my biography. In one instance, I'm reacting as a scientist. In the other, as an octogenarian. In both cases, the issues that interest me are common to the entire world population. They are embedded within deep questions across space and time about the collective future of humankind and about the meaning of planetary identity. I am a physicist who has been studying human interactions with the natural environment for nearly 50 years. I've been particularly drawn to the problem of climate change. In public conversations about climate change in the press and elsewhere, you know that you are highly likely to hear, we must listen to the scientists. What are the climate scientists saying? They're saying that the, climate, that the carbon dioxide molecule 
is a powerful agent in the atmosphere, a mischief molecule. The use of fossil fuels has produced a 30% increase in the atmosphere in 50 years. And on the scale of decades, we are running big risks that are poorly understood. There are no shortcuts to reducing the use of fossil fuels. There is frustration in the community because they are listened to only a little. Their message has not been compelling. With COVID-19, the words widely spoken these past five months have been identical. We must listen to the scientists. But in this case, the scientists have been listened to. We've had science-driven policy nearly worldwide. The public health professionals and immunologists and the infectious disease doctors have called the shots. They have communicated a model which is exceptionally simple and exceptionally powerful. Simpler and more powerful than any model I know of elsewhere in science. They have said, the virus only survives if it finds new people to live in. If one person infects more than one other person, the result is exponential growth. And if that person infects less than the other, the virus dies out. The parameters of contagion are missing, but the model is secure. So the recommendation is robust, keep people apart. Apart means physical distance, masks, quarantines, no large gatherings, and so forth. Public leaders have responded. They have recommended various levels of lockdown. The general public has been compliant, I would say surprisingly compliant, accepting changes in their lives that are uncomfortable, if not wrenching. Any scientist who has wished science to rule the world has seen that wish come true for a short while. I see this dominance of science as stage one, which is ending now. We are entering, entering stage two, where gingerly we are exit from lockdown. The stakes are high because the cases are, if the, if the cases are climbing again, there'll be much resistance where people are told to go back into lockdown. The promise has been that lockdown would be temporary. Science is not in the driver's seat as before. There's great pressure to override the science. Said in other words, the public is recalibrating. Science takes us only so far, they conclude. As, a, as an octogenarian, what else am I thinking about? Greta Thunberg startled many of us with a fresh message. How dare you, she said. How dare you use up our common atmosphere? For you are the older people alive today. And she is speaking on behalf of the younger people. She is reformulating the climate change conversation. Instead of future generations, she is making us con consider, consider current generations. I should not take that plane trip for the benefit of my own grandchildren. COVID-19 too has distinctive age-related features and they are similar. The elderly account for most of the COVID-19 deaths, but no one publicly counters comparisons of the number of deaths in major wars and from, and from COVID-19, even though in major wars, most of the people dying are in their teens and 20s. I find this astonishing. A mainstay of public health cost-benefit analysis is years of life lost rather than lives lost, but no discussion that I encountered today uses that vocabulary. Instead, we are using the ethics of the doctors who are trained to treat each, all lives equally. Two ethical systems are in conflict. I think there is a stage one, stage two sequence here too. The reticence is subsiding. With COVID-19, the world has actually been listening to the scientists, but patience is wearing thin. And the world has been listening to some of the ethicists, but not others. As climate change gradually returns to the world's agenda, who will emerge? What will emerge from the COVID-19? that will be salient for climate change. To be sure, the timeframes are entirely different. Nonetheless, some positive messages are that science is central, but incomplete, that solutions are seriously imperfect, even dangerous, and that investing in climate science needs to be, a, to be investing in ambitious science of all kinds needs to be a societal priority. Regarding the long time horizon of climate change, will it be easier or harder to get the world to pay attention to those not yet born? I think more difficult. We've had a bout of attention to those alive and it will shadow arguments about the future, the deep future for some time. But we can focus on the future for a different and probably more compelling reason. Attending to climate change is about our children and grandchildren. Thank you, Ilka, and thank you, audience. Thank you so much, Rob, for those uh, very uh, good ways to start us off. Uh, Bob, can I call on you to uh, take the ball? Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm pleased to be on this workshop. Uh, I'm not really on, on an island in Maine. That's my, that's my background. Uh, I'm really in Princeton. 
uh, as we've seen, uh, climate change and, and COVID are both existential crises. One is uh, slow moving, one is fast moving, one has been, has been expected for some time, and one was entirely unexpected. What they have in common is serious uncertainty. Uh, in a crisis like these, history can go one way or another uh, due to random shocks. Uh, uh, writing in 1919 during a, a different crisis, 1919 in Germany, Max Weber used the image of railroad switches. Turn the switch to another track as a result of, of leaders' decisions or a shock like COVID, and one goes down that track with no way of returning to the junction. Take the path of, of, of executing the czar, letting Lenin assume power, or, or appointing Hitler chancellor, even after an electoral setback, and history lurches off in new and un, unforeseeable directions. And uh, of course, differences in leadership can make a big difference at, the, at these times. Some leaders have ideological agendas. Uh, Rob was a little bit too sanguine, I think, about our leaders, uh, Trump and Bolsonaro, have not followed the science and they haven't followed it for, uh, uh, for some time. Uh, some leaders seek to gratify only their own emotions. Good leaders uh, consider the consequences of their actions or enduring values and courageously make difficult decisions and trade-offs to achieve, achieve worthwhile objectives. Visionary leaders find, uh, find creative new ways to act which we may hear from Jesse in a few minutes. In a democracy, though, leadership can only be effective with popular support. Behavior of scientists uh, should therefore probe public uh, attitudes on both issues and the sources of support for or opposition to different policy approaches. So behavioral sciences, as opposed to natural scientists, need to, to conduct research that enables us to understand how people are responding to crisis and radical change. That's where the, uh, the project that Elka and, and I come in. We have a survey in the field, with, uh, was in the field in April on COVID and climate change attitudes, ex explicitly comparing people's attitudes toward, uh, toward COVID and, and climate change. And uh, we have support here from Anlinger, from, uh, from PEI, from the Woodrow Wilson School, and, and now for, uh, uh, for future work from the National Science Foundation. I'm going to list just six of the brief, uh, briefly, six of the rough findings that we're coming up with uh, from the first wave. We're, we're still analyzing data, so these, these are very, very tentative findings. First one is that polarization is as bad as you thought. Partisan affiliation is a consistently significant predictor of attitude. In late April, there was more polarization on climate change than on COVID. Not clear that that'll be the case in June. When, when partisans were told the party affiliation of a messenger, their views on the message changed dramatically for Democrats and, and Republicans. Uh, they changed favorably if it was a, a co-partisan messenger, someone of their party, and unfavorably if the messenger was from the other party. Ten, uh, secondly, tentatively, it appears that personal experience may be able to counter partisanship. As subjects reported more personal harm from climate change or COVID, the degree of concern that Republicans and Democrats expressed about the problem converged. Thirdly, Americans, including Republicans, expressed considerable uh, confidence in science. Although confidence levels were lower for Republicans and, and independents on, on climate change than on COVID. Fourth, older people are more, more worried about COVID, younger people more about climate change than was expected. Fifth, the more pride someone expressed in America as a measure of nationalism, the less likely they were to be, to be concerned about climate change, uh, controlling for partisan affiliation. So even controlling for partisan affiliation, if you're more nationalist, you're less likely to be concerned about climate change. And finally, not, not surprisingly, Democrats strongly supported international action involving international organizations on COVID and climate change, Republicans were much less supportive, especially on climate change. Independents were mildly supportive. So partisan affiliation, ideology, age, and nationalism all make a difference in attitude. As we carry out further waves of the survey as much as possible with, it, with the same subjects in a panel design, we hope to be able to identify more precisely the effects of public debate and personal experience on the attitudes and behavior of Americans. And I hope we'll be able to track some of the impact of work like Jesse's, who he's going to, which will be described to us right now. Thank you. 
All right. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Um, obviously, the COVID-19 and the climate crisis share many parallels, as my colleagues have just discussed, um, both in how they've impacted society and how we perceive them and in the role of science and, uh, and scientific knowledge and yeah, identifying key solutions. In my remarks here, I'm also going to highlight how the two crises share critical countermeasures that also have the potential to employ millions of Americans and help repower our overall economy. In parallel, both of these crises, of course, are inflicting major health and economic impacts globally and here in America. Both highlight the importance of science for identifying problems and helping guide prevention and response. And both arose from the scale and connectivity of the modern global economy, and they likewise require effective coordination and cooperation to effectively control them. Both also reveal that in spite of all of civilization's great achievements, we still have cause for humility. Humankind remains deeply vulnerable to natural forces, as we are reminded today by COVID-19, and as we are reminded every time we experience extreme weather events um, and the potential for climate change to exacerbate those events going forward. Also, the impact of COVID-19 will linger for many years well after any vaccine arrives, especially the impacts on our economy and the livelihoods of millions of Americans. We have to remember that the US economy took more than a decade and a major stimulus from the mobilization of the Second World War and the New Deal efforts to fully recover from the Great Depression and enter a new time of prosperity. It likewise took us a decade after the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009 for unemployment levels to fall to pre-recession levels, which they had just reached prior to uh, the onset of COVID-19. And while stocks and corporate profits may have soared in that decade, median household incomes in America had just begun to climb above 2008 levels when COVID-19 struck, meaning we've already lost an entire decade to stagnant wages for most American families. We'll be living with the impacts from climate change for even longer. Once carbon reaches the atmosphere, it can linger there for hundreds to thousands of years. The day the world economy reaches net zero carbon emissions is still decades away, and even that is not the day we end our troubles from climate change. Reaching net zero emissions when human-caused greenhouse gas emissions are equal to and offset by other human-caused activities that enhance sinks that absorb carbon uh, and greenhouse gases. That is simply the day that the atmosphere can begin a long recovery that will slowly reduce the impacts of climate change over centuries, perhaps. There is, however, a common way that we can help our economy and climate recover sooner and more rapidly today. An ambitious push to build a net zero carbon energy and economy, energy system and economy could provide a meaningful share of the economic stimulus needed to power America out of the COVID era and to put America on track to tackle climate change. I'm helping lead Princeton's Net Zero America study, a joint project of the Anlinger Center for Energy and Environment and the Princeton Environment Institute. That study, which will be released this fall, presents the most detailed analysis to date of what is exactly is needed to put the nation on track to eliminate net contributions to global warming by 2050. If we focus just on the next decade ahead, what we find in our analysis is that additional investments equal to roughly $600 billion which to put in context is only 30% of the COVID relief spending to date, of uh, relief spending that's likely to increase substantially in the coming months. If we spread that $600 billion over 10 years, that could be enough to put America on track to achieving our net zero greenhouse gas goal by 2050. Our analysis also shows that the first requirement will be to more than double the total electricity generation from carbon free sources, including wind, solar, hydropower, and nuclear energy by 2030. That will bring the share of our electricity from carbon-free sources to in the range of 60 to 75% of our electricity by 2030, up from about 40% today. Most of that growth in carbon-free electricity over the next decade will come from wind and solar power, which are increasingly affordable and already employed half a million Americans in 2019. By 2030, over 3 million new jobs could be added in the wind and solar industries if we deploy these technologies at the scale um, outlined in our uh, analysis. There'll be yet more skilled workers employed constructing high voltage transmission lines to connect these clean American energy sources to cities and industries across the country. Second, electrifying cars, trucks, and home heating will enable that new clean electricity to displace oil and natural gas use in these activities, activities that traditionally have not been powered by electricity. The U.S. could leverage today's zero interest environment to provide low cost capital to retool and repower American manufacturing to produce globally competitive electric vehicles and efficient electric heat pumps. 
If we do this right, this push could help onshore high-scale manufacturing jobs and create a more localized supply chain that's less vulnerable to future disruptions, whether from pandemics or climate-related disasters. Additionally, steps for reaching net zero carbon could also help employ skilled workers in the US oil and gas sectors, which are reeling today as COVID-19 has crushed short-term energy demand. Some of the now idle drilling rigs and skilled crews could get back to work applying techniques similar to hydraulic fracturing to create so-called enhanced geothermal energy systems, which could ultimately provide more carbon-free electricity than today's nuclear power fleet today, which supplies about one in five uh, kilowatt hours in the country. Pipeline workers could also begin working now to build a CO2 superhighway, a network of trunk pipelines that can carry CO2 captured at power plants and industrial processes across the country to storage locations concentrated in the Gulf Coast, West Texas, and the Dakotas. To make that project work best, the government could also fund a program to characterize the best specific locations in each of these basins to inject CO2 deep underground for permanent and safe storage. These are just three areas in which we could leverage our investments in a uh, carbon-free economy to also put Americans back to work um, on the order of millions of Americans. The coronavirus has caused a profound shock to our economy, and I want to be clear, this clean energy e effort alone cannot put America back to work. Nor will near-term stimulus measures over the next few years be sufficient to fund the decades-long effort to build a net zero carbon economy. Yet, an ambitious course of action today can help confront both climate change and the COVID challenges at once and point our nation toward a cleaner and more resilient future. It would undoubtedly cost us far no more not to try to link our efforts to tackle both challenges. Finally, as the youngest member of our distinguished panel, I also wanted to pick up on Rob Sokolow's comments about the differences between COVID and climate change and the near and present danger of the former versus the intergenerational threat of the latter. As one of the newer cohort of researchers tackling the climate challenge, the impacts feel for me far less distant and intergenerational than it may for the generation currently occupying leadership positions in government, industry, and other sectors. I am of course older than Greta Thunberg and her cohort who are now taking up the activist mantle to pressure our leaders to act now rather than in the future. But I will be 65 years old when 2050 arrives, younger still than my august colleagues Rob and Bob on this panel. And my son, interestingly enough, will be the exact same age in 2050 as I was when he was born. The timeline then for climate change impacts and our remaining time to mitigate the worst effects might feel far off on the one hand. Yet as parents are fond of saying, the days feel long, but the years feel short. And for me at least, the time is short to act to prevent the worst impacts of climate change, not just for future generations, but for my own and for my sons. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jesse, and uh, thanks to all three of you. Uh, just a request to our audience, if you have questions you want to ask the panel uh, in, in the, next, the last uh, 20 minutes left in the session, please enter them into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, I will maybe sort of start us off by uh, posing a question uh, to all of us, uh, maybe sort of starting off with uh, the, the last observation that Jesse mentioned, the intergenerational dilemma. Uh, that Rob introduced initially. Uh, that the fact that uh, Bob also mentioned you know, that old people tend to be afraid of COVID uh, and young people are afraid of, of, of climate change. What can we do to uh, increase cooperation on both of these uh, issues uh, between the young and the old uh, related to my previous comments, but also uh, in this generation, current and future generations, but also between nations, because again, both of these uh, crises really require cooperation uh, across national boundaries. So any sort of thoughts uh, from the panel on how to increase cooperation and how to motivate uh, cooperation? Well, both are global in, intrinsically. I mean, the carbon dioxide is shared by the planet and the, uh, the disease is, knows no boundary. I mean, it's almost ironic. We've got boundaries, state to state boundaries in the United States for the first time in forever. People are not allowed to stop in a state and have to keep going. We've, we've got borders uh, beyond whatever we saw before, but we have problems that are deeply intrinsically international compared to some of the others, like weapons, which are which have a strong national feature. This has no national feature at all, except in the solutions. Of course. So we should, both subjects ought to be promoting a kind of planetary thinking. Uh, they're gifts for those who would like, like me, who would like to see stronger planetary thinking. 
So, so let me say, I'm, I'm a student of international cooperation most of the time, not usually a survey researcher. Um, and the key to international cooperation is self-interest and incentives. Uh, in the case of COVID, there are very direct incentives. If it's, if it's endemic somewhere else with international travel, it will come to you. With climate change, the incentives have been unfortunately too weak. It's a collective action problem. It appears to be uh, not so strongly in the self-interest of any given country to make a large contribution if others don't. Uh, so I think we're gonna see, uh, it's gonna be easier to have cooperation on COVID. It'll be faster. It'll be more pressing to people. I think we hope that we can carry over some of that experience into climate change. And some of the questions on our, on our questionnaire are our attempt to see whether people having observed cooperation on COVID will be more willing to support it on climate change. I'll say personally, as a, as a grandparent, uh, the way to make the connection, Elka, bet between the old and, and the young is to mobilize the grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just add, I, I agree entirely with Rob about the importance of linking incentives and self-interest to motivate and sustain cooperation. And so one of the things that we're very much focused on in the Net Zero America study is not just another modeling study of what, you know, makes sense from an engineering or economic perspective as to, you know, what things we want to build to lower the cost of uh, reaching net zero goals. Of course, the total cost is a relevant piece of the political challenge. But what we find is actually the total cost doesn't vary all that dramatically across many of the different scenarios that we run. But what does vary is the distribution of both benefits and costs across the country, where we build new infrastructure, where we retire old infrastructure, the kinds of jobs that are created, the kinds of environmental or scenic impacts of new infrastructure that we have to build. And so what our report is really focused on is those um, you know, non-modeled impacts, the sort of beyond cost and, and basic engineering, uh, trying to look at where resources will be deployed across the country and what kinds of impacts, both positive and negative, those might have. And I think that kind of effort from the research community and from others to try to better understand the distribution of costs and benefits of a clean energy transition is going to be critical to building the political coalitions and um, sustained support that you need to enact those kinds of changes. And I, my view is that because of the public good nature of climate mitigation because of the sort of uh, collective action challenge that Robert, that um, Bob mentioned. It's unlikely that we're going to be able to muster the kind of maximum, you know, support that you would want to see from a kind of global optimum to tackle climate change. And so that means we have to be smart as well in each of our countries to design policies that not only help us start to tackle climate change, but make it easier for all others to tackle climate change by reducing the cost of action. And the most powerful way we have to do that is through innovation and improvements in the cost and performance of technology solutions to climate change. We've already made wind and solar and increasingly lithium ion batteries and electric vehicles incredibly cheap uh, and increasingly cost competitive with minimal public support um, relative to conventional fossil fuel power plants or internal combustion engine vehicles. That didn't come out of nowhere. That came out of decades of proactive public policy support that supported wind and solar from their nascent stages, drove increasing innovation in R&D, uh, and learning by doing an experience that only comes from deploying these technologies at scale in the field and the economies of scale and experience that comes from that. And so we managed to drop the cost of wind by 75%, of solar by 90%, and of electric vehicle batteries by nearly 90% just over the last decade due to the kinds of sustained policies. And so um, I think that what we need to do is continue to leverage that kind of influence. And the United States is in many ways uniquely positioned to do that given our um, technological capabilities and the size of our market. But we can also coordinate with other countries um, in either a loose or, or tight fashion to tackle certain innovation challenges and to try to complete the overall toolkit of resources that we need to finish the job. And so, you know, some countries that are well positioned, for example, to tackle carbon capture and sequestration could band together to work on improving that technology. Others that have geothermal potential could work on that. Others that have strong, you know, steel production or cement production could partner on developing solutions for those sectors. And so those kinds of more loosely coupled partnerships around particular industries that are of more direct self-interest is likely to be, I think, a more effective strategy than trying to come up with sort of a globally harmonized um, approach to tackling climate change. Let me, let me emphasize the distributional point. Uh, it is a severe distributional question, as Jesse says. A famous book in political science 85 years ago was entitled Politics, Who Gets What, When, and How? And that gets at the point of it. If we are going to solve this problem, we need a political strategy. And I think Jesse's work recognizes that 
that provides incentives to red states for action on climate change. On, on, on climate change. It can't simply be uh, on the backs of people who believe in it because they listen, listen to scientists and believe in the public good. So I have so many additional questions to, to the panelists, yeah, which starting sort of with Jesse's point uh, about investing in this green infrastructure, which sounds so compelling to me. And at the same time, there's political opposition against that, you know, which gets to the solution aversion that we have and the pol political polarization that, 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 that Bob mentioned. But I do want to give our audience a chance to ask questions. So let me sort of uh, start uh, by giving the, the, the floor to Diego Negron first. And Diego, I think sort of your, your, your mute should be deactivated and you can ask your question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Great, so I'm Diego Class in 2018. I was a Woody Woo student. Uh, my question is, what are the conditions that climate change has created or facilitated that made us increasingly vulnerable to a disease like COVID-19. So is there a relationship between the two that we can also talk about in that sense? If we like to take that. I think, I think the connections are, are quite limited. We've had, we've had pandemics before. There is this view that we, animals and people are being brought closer together as habitat is invaded upon. Uh, and that's, I guess, the strongest connection one can draw, but I think it, to think of them as parallel problems, and there are others as well, like weapons that we, uh, can, they're all connected, but loosely connected. We've got to take them on and look. We can, we can transfer strategies from one to the other, but I think they're not that intercausal. Yeah, I think rather than intercausal, they share common causes in some ways, right? So the you know interconnectivity and scale of the global population and economies make it easier for pandemics to spread this century than last century. And of course, it contributes much more rapidly to greenhouse gas accumulation as well. Um, but I don't see a lot of direct you know causal links between climate change and, and pandemic here in this case anyway. Maybe for other pandemics that have disease vectors like mosquitoes or something like that that might be changing their range in the future. But for this particular one, it doesn't seem to be the case, at least as far as I know. We have another question from George Strongulist. Now, can you hear me, please? Yes. Uh, I'm thrilled to see Professor Sokolo again. Uh, hello. Uh, I was... Uh, a student in 1973, I graduated um, from astrophysical sciences. I, for, I worked a long time, for a long time in the European Commission in Brussels uh, on climate change. And clearly one of the major problems we have is how weak the UN is when it comes to enforcing such uh, agreements like the Paris Agreement. How can we get uh, this institution stronger? How can we change essentially the American attitude, the current uh, policies of the United States so that we could possibly uh, reinforce the UN institutions like the Paris Agreement and of course the World Health Organization when it comes to finding synergies between uh, climate change and the COVID problem. Okay, you have to recognize that the United States has long been reluctant about international organizations under Democrats and Republicans, more, more Republicans, but certainly the U.S. has been the reluctant partner on the U.N. Um, and in particular, and it's not surprising because in general, powerful states are less inclined to support international organizations than middle powers like the Europeans. And, and the Europeans are, of course, also very used to international cooperation in, in the EU. So you're, it's not just Trump. Trump has made things much worse. But it won't go back to a situation where the U.S. is an enthusiastic supporter of the United Nations as such. Uh, the, a great power like the United States, it's also, also true of China, uh, is going to uh, believe that it can largely handle its own interests and will be reluctant to give up a lot of authority, the sovereign authority to international institutions. Now, I spent my life studying international institutions. As I say, I, I'm, I'm a great supporter of them, but a sad truth is they're not going to enforce anything on the great powers. They may encourage, they may structure the incentives properly, they may create situations where you can have a number of states collaborating and uh, induce great powers to go along. 
they're not going to enforce things against great power will. This is a great segue to a question from Claudia Humphrey. Can hear you. Okay. Um, just wondering what the connection is between um, the election and, or the upcoming presidential election, and um, how that is going to impact how uh, the American government responds to both the climate crisis and um, the COVID crisis. Sorry, that's, that's a political science question too, I think. Well, it's clear it'll have a huge impact because if you look at the, at the positions of the two parties and the two candidates, they're wildly different. And this is also true of their supporters. Uh, my, my polarization point was meant to indicate that. Republicans are much, more, uh, are much less interested in climate change, somewhat less involved in COVID, much more opposed to government intervention in general. And so that there would be a big difference if the Democrats actually win win the election, and especially if they win both houses of Congress, there'll be a huge difference in policy, as there was on health care in, in, in 2009. Uh, now, that's by no means assured. I'm not making a prediction about the election outcome, but it's pre what's, what's pretty clear is that if the Democrats were to win, you'd have a whole different set of elites in power who are committed to climate change policy, who would be much more, much more supportive of, of, of Jesse's proposals than their Republicans would be. Yeah, and I guess just, just to add to that a more a general point that I think you hinted at, uh, Bob, is that beyond the individual policy you know, fronts, I think it's pretty clear that both parties and particularly the current um, iteration of the Republican Party have very different views about the role of government and you know, public institutions in America. And as we've seen in the kind of response to COVID-19 and also the you know, overall staffing of federal agencies over the, you know, the last several years under the Trump administration, um, you know, this, this current government has a very you know, minimalist approach as to the role of these agencies. And I think that what these challenges, both COVID-19 and climate change make very apparent is that as large collective action problems that have substantial public good type natures, we really can't do this alone with the private sector, right? We need to have um, effective government institutions as well. And so the sort of just broad philosophical approaches of the two parties towards the role of government also I think has a pretty direct bearing on the capabilities of government institutions to tackle um, these kinds of challenges as well. One sentence addition is they're also entirely different in their view of the role of science. But, but notice that the uh, National Republican Party and the governors are very different. If you look right. at, at the Republican governors, their policies have been about as uh, science driven as the Democratic governors, with two or three, with, with, with two or three exceptions. Uh, and they have uh, uh, been, so they have not necessarily uh, trumpeted that they were very different from, from Trump's policies, but they have been. So if it may not be as deep in the Republican Party uh, as, it, as it seems. There are Republican elites in Maryland, Massachusetts, uh, many other states who would take a much less Trumpian view of science if they had a chance. And traditionally, of course, you know, in, the, in, in the old days, uh, a century ago, the Republican Party was much more pro-science than the Democratic Party was. The Democratic Party was anti-evolution much of it under Brian. So it doesn't, it, it's, it's not a permanent condition. Oh, and it could, it could be the case that, there are, the, that a future uh, GOP uh, turns out to be more, more pro-science than the current one. In the 1970s and 80s, as environmental policy got going, the Republicans were very much in the driver's seat. So the next question is from Michael Skla. Can everyone hear me now? Yes. Hello, I'm class of 1984. I was um, an MAE uh, uh, major with a concentration in energy systems and also a Woodrow Wilson certificate uh, graduate. So I think I touch all, all three bases. I worked for the EPA for about nine years uh, when we could actually uh, um, advance the ball. So that was a, that was a good time. Um, and uh, my, my question is, uh, you know, when it comes to the uh, solutions, 
of uh, the, the technical solutions to mitigate or solve both the COVID pandemic and climate change. We have those off the shelf solutions. Um, they may not be perfect, we can make them better, we can come up with new ones and make them cheaper. Um, but, um, but you know, we do have off the shelf solutions. The challenge does seem to be more political and social than technical. So what are the positive steps that we can take to uh, address those political and social challenges to move forward? We've talked about, you've talked about um, increasing incentives. I'd be interested in some specific um, policies or actions that, uh, that could be taken to, I guess, shift the, shift the political and social terrain on which, uh, on which we respond to these crises. Well, um, let me just I'll make, make a, I'll make, I'll just you go ahead. Yeah, let me just make, I guess, a brief comment before we talk about the politics that you're happy to talk about after you, uh, Bob. But uh, just on the technical front, I do think it's a little less binary maybe than the way you've framed it, Michael. We, we, do, have, we do have solutions to deploy to get started in confronting the, both COVID-19 and climate change, right? But we clearly need additional solutions to be added to our Absolutely. toolkit to effectively, you know, tackle the challenge. So I do want to make sure we're, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. So just as yes. we can deploy the current set of tests, we can work on cheaper scalable testing for COVID. We can work on vaccines and the same is true for climate change. We can deploy wind and solar and batteries today at an increasing, you know, very little additional cost because we've invested in those technologies in the past. And at the same time that we're ramping up those technologies to begin driving down emissions over the next decade, we also need to be expanding and improving the overall range of tools that we need, including some for very difficult to mitigate sectors, you know, that we don't have good viable commercial uh, solutions for today, uh, including, you know, long distance transportation and uh, aviation, uh, industrial activities and, and other sectors. So we have to do both, right? Use what we have now. You know, you go to war with the arsenal you have, but you don't stop developing the next generation um, of, of, you know, of tools and weapons to, to confront the challenge. Cri uh, crises cause harm, but they also reveal. And this crisis has revealed the fundamental inequality of American life. Uh, our record is the worst, is essentially the worst in the world. We're the po most powerful state in the world, one of the, one of the wealthiest, and our record on deaths is just about as bad as anybody's or worse. And that comes from uh, not having a public health care system, having a largely privatized nurse, nursing system, having tremendous racial and social inequality. And not surprisingly, it's the racial minorities, the poor and the people in nursing homes who have suffered most. So this crisis reveals what a lot of people have been saying for 30 years, that the US is becoming more and more unequal society. And it's much more unequal than most societies in the world, almost any. I mean, Brazil also hit hard, it's more unequal than we are, but there aren't, aren't very many um, wealthy countries that are. Uh, so uh, maybe you know, there's, there's some possibility that the social change that is generated by a realization of this great inequality, which has not just effects of somebody has a Mercedes, someone has a Honda, somebody dies and somebody, somebody goes to Florida. Uh, that is a big difference. And I think you, it, it, there's a possibility, I, I, I won't predict it that this could be a turning point in politics the way the Great Depression was. Let me just yeah. add yeah. one, one comment that both of these crises actually require behavior change in their solutions, yeah, including so the acceptance of new technologies. And I think one thing that we've seen with the, the COVID crisis is that uh, people are at least in the short run willing to incur a tremendous amount of behavior change, you know, if, if, if properly motivated. And so I guess the takeaway is yeah, how, how, to, how to motivate people to do it for climate change as well, and how to focus you know, on, 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 on the costs and benefits individually and socially. I think we might have time for a couple more questions. So let me call on Chana Weber. Hello. Um, nice to see your faces and hear your voices. Um, so my question is, if, if uh, it, for someone um, sort of advanced in their career in this moment, if you had a choice of action between implementing meaningful behind the scenes sort of local solutions right now, or getting involved in national and international communications and outreach, on climate climate action, say, which would you do? I've had hundreds of conversations where that question was in play. And my answer usually is, what do you really like to do? There's plenty of 
you, where you, what, what are you going to get ex be excited about when you get up in the morning? For some people, it's dealing with other cultures, and with others, it's dealing with next door. I don't see any reason why one should imagine that there's a solution, that, an answer to that question that's, that's universal. There's so many ways of contributing, whether you're an artist, whether you're a scientist, whether you're a lawyer, a journalist, uh, in that level, and whether you're focused on this, at the local level or the national level or global level, there's so much to do. That's great. Yeah, I, would, I would say, first, it's not always a choice. You can do both. And some of us are involved both ways. But essentially, I think you ask yourself two other questions besides Rob's. One is, what are you good at? And what leverage do you have? If you're somebody who, like a friend of mine, is tied up in a whole variety of high, high, high status, elite uh, national and international networks, she's working on COVID with her networks. That's the right thing to do. If you're someone like, like people I know in, in Islesford, Maine, who are on the island, and, and they're trying to get solar power on, on, on the neighborhood house, they're working locally as they should. They have no influence internationally except their vote. You have to ask yourself, what are you good at and where are your leverage? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I've always said to folks, find the biggest lever that you can find and pull on it as hard as you can, right? And that's going to be different for every person based on their connections and skill sets and expertise. Um, and I would say if you are working on local actions, you know, those that have the greatest impact are those that can be scalable and replicable by others and that you can um, either uh, through your leadership and example, help others adopt those same methods or through your actions, reduce the cost or barriers for others to follow you. Those will help things, uh, help those actions be replicable and have greater impact than, than, you know, in your community, but beyond that as well. And I think that connects just the same to what individual nations can do. We were talking about the politics of you know, these actions, we're not going to have a coordinated global response, you know, managed out of the UN, unfortunately. Um, but we are, we can think about what we can do that's in, within our impact, uh, within our capabilities in each country, um, and that would have the greatest impact by making it easier for others to follow. I think there's a lot of effort and discussion in kind of moralistic tones um, when we talk about climate change of sort of doing our part and then if we do that and we show our leadership and our moral courage, then others will follow us out of, you know, a sense of moral duty. I think there's some degree of that will happen, but it's probably going to be far underwhelming. Um, but what if what I think constitutes true leadership is leadership that makes it easier for others to follow you. And so if you are making action, taking actions to make it others for, easier for others to replicate those actions, whether that's at a community level or a national level, those are the kinds of strategies that can snowball and have the biggest impact, I think, in accelerating our progress towards uh, mitigating climate change. And whatever you do, don't say, I can't make a difference. Because, because the difference is made by, none of us individually makes a huge difference on these two problems. But if, and we also don't act, don't, if we don't act, act if, if none of us acts, we'll do nothing. And also never say game over, because there's always a better and a worse path from here. Yeah, I think that's a key point, Rob. It's, it, we hear a lot of rhetoric around that. We have X years to you know, act or it's all over. Uh, you know, the science is very clear that every tenth of a degree matters. And you know, every effort we take to bend the curve down will, will help. Um, and so I think that it's very clear. Yeah, don't don't give up. Get up in the morning and do it, everything you can. And when you get frustrated and burn out, take a break, recharge. I want to give the last question uh, to Richard Moss, who is not only an alumnus uh, but also a resident uh, fellow at the Endinger Center right now. Richard. Hey, great. Thanks, Elka. And um, I'm a, so I'm a, yeah, as Elka said, a Wilson School alumnus, and I've had the privilege of being at the Endinger Center for at least part of this year. Um, hoping to get back over the summer at some point. Um, I, Elka, this really picks up on a point you made, but I wanted to ask all of you on the panel, um, what do you think we can learn from COVID responses that will help motivate the kind of transformation that we are really going to need to see, not only in technology systems, but also in social and economic systems and even personal belief systems and behavior to really address the climate change? Um, and, you know, I just noticed that there's some uh, anecdotal, uh, anecdotal reports that people are seeing benefits to COVID responses, like you know, slower traffic in their neighborhoods or better environmental quality, things like that. Even though the you know they understand that the whole you know whole situation is a disaster and nobody really likes shutting down the economy. Nonetheless, there are benefits. Um, so, are you looking at that in your survey? And do you see anything we can learn for the transformation for climate? 
maybe I can start on that and, and say, I think we're seeing right now under COVID uh, feedback that people receive about behaviors that they were before sort of reluctant to engage in, like uh, at, at the individual level and also at the corporate level. So allowing people to work from home, you know, the, the notion was, well, maybe they've become sort of less efficient and productivity will go down. Well, it turns out that sort of right now we're finding out that despite the fact that most of us have small children at home, productivity hasn't suffered so much and a lot of people are quite happy to work at home. And so companies like, uh, I think, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, and Square actually have uh, told the employees they can start working from home indefinitely, even after the COVID pandemic, you know, sort of as, 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 a function of, as a function of personal preference. So I do think sort of we're getting feedback on lots of dimensions that status quo bias maybe prevented us from getting before, uh, and, and that will be useful. At the same time, I don't think you know, sort of that this, this is going to be sort of, you know, sort of a, a Pollyanna-ish you know, sort of silver lining. There also is a lot of feedback that will be bad. You know, Jesse already mentioned the fact that public transit will take you know, sort of a, a, a big hit uh, for, for public health reasons. So I think there are lessons going in both directions, but it certainly is an, an important learning opportunity right now. So I hope that academics will learn the lesson that traveling farther doesn't convey status. Uh, in, in, in my experience, academics tend to believe that if you're invited to Kazakhstan, that's better being invited than being invited to Rutgers. Because somebody paid you to send you to Kazakhstan, it may be a typical, uh, a, a terrible place and a terrible conference, but still you're being, you're being paid to go there. And so people get on planes and go places where they shouldn't be. And maybe academics, maybe we'll look at ourselves a little bit and ask ourselves, are we going to that conference because we're making a contribution or learning something, or are we going because we think it add, adds to our status? Since over the last three months, none of us has gone anywhere. Yeah, yeah I'll just just add, I, I think, um, you know, I met, mentioned this comment before, but I do think that, and this may, you know, this is gonna be fundamentally affected by the partisan nature of our kind of information filters and our leaders right now, but, to the degree that we do have governors of both parties acting in certain ways. I, I do think, I do hope at least that um, we see in our response to COVID-19 the importance of effective, you know, cooperative action and of governments in leading that and coordinating that in ways that are impossible otherwise, particularly if you care about equitable outcomes, right? So Google and Facebook and Princeton have the resources to go and start our own testing regimes or, you know, make sure that our, our own, you know, populations are safe. But if you care about the broader population, only the government can take that action. And the same is true of climate change, right? And we, you know, wealthy people, companies, you know, wealthy cities, those with means can do far more to mitigate the, or to adapt to and reduce the impacts of climate change. Um, but only effective government action can lead to equitable solutions. And so I do hope that we see the parallels in society as to, you know, the, the collective action nature of, of the COVID-19 threat and responses required and the kinds of responses that we need to tackle climate change and that that maybe redoubles our belief in, in the importance of, of effective government institutions and in helping coordinate those responses. I must bring up that we really don't know yet really how bad or, or mild this climate, this COVID-19 episode is going to be, nor about how terrible climate change will be. There is a possibility that we will not be out of the woods a year from now when we have the next set of panels in terms of COVID-19, especially if it takes off in the developing countries in ways we can scarcely imagine, but are beginning to get indications of. We may have second rounds here. Uh, if we're lucky, we'll be able to talk about lessons learned uh, at the next panel. As far as climate change is concerned, we really don't know how, about how strong the positive, the, the negative consequences are of the positive feedbacks that are in the, in the system. And we could, we could find that we have far greater urgency to deal with climate change than we actually imagine at this time, or less. So and then, I, so Richard, I guess your question has, has particular relevance if the COVID-19 problem turns out to be easy and the climate change problem turns out to be specific, the greatest difficulty, but there are all the other combinations as well. So, so I agree, and it seems to me that one thing we can, we can come away with is we're in a situation of uncertainty, not risk. Uncertainty is, is Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns. We don't know the probability functions for these things. Right? So modesty and, 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 and humility, which I think Jesse started with, are necessary. I agree. 
I, I think we agree on that and sort of this uh, a lesson in humility is a good idea. At the same time, also, I think we have to learn to sort of use modeling approaches and policy approaches that incorporate uh, and, 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 and work with that uncertainty rather than denying it. So on uh, that less than cheerful note, <laughs> I have to bring this session to a close. Uh, I sincerely hope we won't be doing this virtually next year, but uh, uh, Rob is absolutely right. You know, sort of, you know, sort of time, only time will tell. I want to thank my panelists you know, for their really insightful remarks. I want to thank the audience. Uh, and almost more than 170 of you attended this for your thoughtful questions. I apologize. We didn't have time to get to all of them. Uh, but yeah, thank you for your interest. Uh, and we will continue this in the future. Thanks. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Thank you.